<clears throat> so last time, we had introduced this idea of an orthonormal basis. So just recall, an orthonormal basis, two words put together here. Oh, do you know what it means when you put two words together? Do you know the word for that? Like vlog, video blog, or um, what's another one where you put two words together? It's a portmanteau, it's a French word. So it's orthogonal and normal are being put together for orthonormal. An orthonormal basis, uh, let's say B, comprising some vectors V1 through Vn for a, a vector space, but it's a vector space that has some choice of inner product. So we say for an inner product space, inner product space V, so you know, this could be Rn or maybe some you know, set of matrices or a set of polynomials or whatever your vector space is that also then has an inner product chosen. An orthonormal basis for an inner product space V um, satisfies two properties. First, any two vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other. So for instance, that is the inner product between VI and VJ is going to be zero for all i not equal to j. So this is what I mean by mutually orthogonal. If you pick any two, they're orthogonal to each other. That's the oath or ortho part. And the normal part is that if you find the inner product of anything with itself, it'll come out to be one. So that is we've normalized it, right? If you have something that's just orthogonal, you can just turn those all into unit vectors by dividing up by their norm, and then you would end up with something that's orthonormal. So that's, that's what we had last time. And, and so I think a good place to start would be for us just to like maybe think of some examples of this, or maybe one example in particular. So let's consider the um, space, so example, Let's consider P1. So this is my polynomials of degree at most one, so constants and linear functions, right? And let's consider um, as my inner product just the dot product. And so recall what I mean by that is I mean the inner product of some AX plus B with some cx plus d is, well, you just take the corresponding coordinate vectors. So the coordinate vector for this guy is, oh, I guess I should, typically what I do is I have the constant first and I build up. So I'm gonna be consistent with that, c plus dx. And then I have my coordinate vector. So the first coordinate is your constant and the second coordinate is the coefficient of your x just dotted with your c, d. And so then it just comes out to be a c plus b, d. So, so that's a perfectly fine inner product. I mean, it's a dot product, and we built the inner product to generalize dot product, so it's definitely gonna satisfy all the properties of an inner product. But here's my question. What's an example of an orthonormal basis here? What would be such a basis for, for P1 with this inner product being the dot product. One in X, beautiful. You can just consider one X because if you think like, what is the inner product of one with X? Well, that's just one is one zero and X is zero one. So that comes out to be zero. And alternatively, you can ask, well, what's the inner product of one with itself? Well, that's just one zero dot with one zero. So that's one. Or you can ask, what's the inner product of x with itself? And that's just zero, one, zero, one. So that's also one. So that gives you a, a orthonormal basis, one x. Can you think of a different orthonormal basis that you could have chosen instead? Yeah. 
Okay, sounds like you did something complicated, but that probably works. You divide it all by two? Yeah. No. Yeah, root two divided by two. Oh, root two divided by two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. You, there's, there's one that looks like that. I'm not going to write it. I was thinking you just do like a minus one. Right? It, um, yours is very good. If we, if we just do a negative one, notice it still gives you all the properties you want. Like if you have a negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, it works out. Or a negative x, right? So, but you could also do something more complicated like what you named. So, so don't think that these are unique. You can have several different orthonormal bases for an inner product space. Okay, great. But what if I took P1 and instead of doing this dot product, I define my inner product of A plus BX with C plus DX to be this, this inner product we introduced, I don't know, one or two lectures ago, where I say find the definite integral from zero to one of one of these guys, A plus BX times the other guy, C plus DX. And we checked before that in fact that is an inner product. It's linear, since we're, over, we're working over R, this is over the real numbers, so it's, it's actually bilinear, it's linear of both terms, it's commutative, and it's positive definite. Okay, so that's an inner product. So now we want to find some, some basis, right? An orthonormal basis. And you might be like, well, well why don't we just do one and x? Or well, we've already seen this, I think, before. If we try and do one of x with this norm, with this, with this inner product, it becomes the definite integral from zero to one of one times x, which is indefinite integral is one half x, evaluate at zero and one. It's one half. It's not zero, right? So one and x are not orthogonal to each other with respect to this inner product. So, so that's not going to work. Let me, let me like put a big red line through it. That's not going to work. So let's try and build something that does work. Okay. I want two vectors. Let me, let me just keep the first vector. I guess I should call them like f of x and g of x. Let me just keep the first vector as one. I mean, if, if you do one, the inner product of one with itself, what do we get? Zero, one, one, dx. So it's just x evaluated at zero and one. So it's just one. So it's like, okay, at least one has unit length, right? So like one's a nice one. The problem is now we want to find something else that's orthogonal to one. So now I want to find some g of x. I guess I can keep calling it c plus dx. So that, well, first we want to make sure that g of x is orthogonal to f of x. And then we want to make sure that g of x has length one. OK, how could we possibly do this? Well, we just say, what happens if we do the inner product of one with c plus dx? Here we go. We're going to get 0, 1. Oh, oh I don't think this is the most efficient way to do it. Eh, I think it'll work out. Um, c plus dx dx. Oh, this is very confusing, that dx, isn't it? <laughs> that dx is not the same as that dx. <laughs> this dx is an italics or something, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what do we get? Um, this is going to become cx. I'll just write it out. cx one, um, plus one half dx squared from zero to one. Um, the zero kills everything, so you're left with just c plus one half d. But what do we want this to be? Zero. It's like I want this to be zero. So like, what should C and D be? I don't know, lots of possibilities. Let's just pick one. So what's one possibility we could do for C and D? Well, I don't want to deal with, okay, we can do one half, but I don't want to deal with fractions. So give me integer values. 
Uh, negative, what? Well, why would you do that? Why would you do negative one and two? <laughs> right, like all of yours are fine, but like surely you should do like negative one and two or one and negative two, right? Like that's the obvious one sitting there, but any of yours are fine. Um, let, me, let me just do the one I want though. <laughs> so <laughs> let me do minus one plus two X. That'll do the trick. So negative one and two, that, that'll work. Okay, so now we have two of the conditions satisfied. If you have the inner product one of itself, it's one. If you have the inner product between these, we built it so it's zero. Now we just wanna make sure that the inner product of G with itself is one. And it's like, well, that's quite unlikely. You might have to take the inner product of this with itself. It probably won't be one, but we can scale by something to make sure it's one, right? So it's like, what should it be? Well, it should really be this times some scalar value. So, so I've been using a lot of letters. Let me use alpha. I don't know what that scalar is, but we're gonna have scalar by something. Maybe it is by you know, two or a half, I don't know. We're gonna have scalar by something, so then it comes out that we do, when you do the inner product, it gives you one. So to find out what that scalar is, just plug it in. Minus one plus two x alpha inner product with minus one plus two x alpha. Oh wait, the inner product of something with itself is actually giving you the magnitude of that thing squared, right? Magnitude squared is inner product of itself. So the, if I want this magnitude to be one, it should be the square root of that. This didn't matter up here because the square root of one is just one. But, but we need to remember, we do need to take the square root of this. Because we eventually want this to come out to be one. Okay, so what do we get? We get the square root of the definite integral from zero to one of this guy squared of minus one plus two x squared times alpha squared times dx. Okay, um, you do like a little bit of chain rule or use substitution or whatever the words are, where you're like, we're taking the antiderivative of this, he's gonna jump up to be the third power which means we need a one third out front, but also um, the two is gonna come out and cancel, so we also need a one half out front. So I think, I think this antiderivative is one sixth, and since this is a constant, he just stays constant of alpha squared from zero to one. So um, you guys know calculus, did I do this right? Does that antiderivative look correct? I think so. I see head shaking, so I think we're on the right track. So now let's plug in zero and one. Oh, still taking the square root. If I plug in one, that's just one cubed. So it's one sixth of alpha, one sixth of alpha cubed. Minus plug in zero, that's minus one cubed. So it's minus one sixth, minus one sixth, uh, minus minus one sixth becomes plus one sixth of alpha squared. So what do we get here? Well, we get that the square root of alpha squared divided by three, because a six plus a six is a third, should be one. Okay, that just tells us that alpha is the square root of three. Alpha is the square root of three. Did I do it correct? I think so. So our function g of x should just be the function minus the square root of three plus two square roots of three x, which I'll just note is not what anyone said when I asked for values of C and D. Anyway, but you just pick one that's perpendicular, that's orthogonal, and then you just scale it appropriately to make sure that its magnitude comes out to be one. Yeah? So we're good at finding orthonormal bases now. But I want to notice a curious property. What if, what if I ask you, 
Okay, so let me give this basis some name. Let's call this basis um, B. It's the basis that has one and as the second vector minus square root three plus two square root three x. What if I ask you, what is the dot product between one and x with the coordinates expressed in terms of this basis. See, before we did the dot product of one and x, by expressing the coordinates in terms of the standard basis, one and x, and it came out to be zero. But what if now we want to express the dot product between one and x in terms of this new basis, this new orthonormal basis we just built. Well, to do this, we need to figure out how to rewrite one and x in terms of this basis. One is easy, one is just one, right? So, so the, coordinate vector, the, the, the coordinate vector for one in terms of this basis is just one, zero. One copy of one, zero copies of this. But how do we write x as a linear combination of so many copies of one with so many copies of minus three plus two root three x? Like how, how, many, how is this gonna come out to be x? What should we do? What should my coefficients here be? Or like, yeah, I, I need to get rid of this guy up front so he just becomes an x, right? So let me divide by two root three. And so like now I just have an x, but I also have here a negative one half, right? I wanna get rid of that negative one half. So here I need a positive one half. So I can write x as one half and one over two root three. Okay. And then what's the dot product come out to be? Does that one half look familiar? Oh, a half is what we got when we just calculated, where'd it go? Right here. When we calculate the inner product with respect to this, this definition, the, the definition go from zero to one, right? When we calculate the inner product this way, we got a half. This, this is the same, this came out to be the same as the inner product between one and x. This is an orthonormal basis with respect to this inner product and calculating this inner product came out to be the same as calculating the dot product with respect to this orthonormal basis. So let's generalize that. Theorem. If B is in orthonormal basis, for an inner product space V, then I claim that the inner product between some V and W is really just the same as calculating the dot product between V and W of the coordinate vectors with respect to the basis B. May not be your standard basis, but it's an orthonormal basis. And so what this is really showing us is that the inner product really is just a special dot product. If you pick your basis correctly, your basis has this nice product of being, this nice property of being orthonormal. Okay, yeah. Ah, um, 
no, it's not only over real. So I'm going to prove this in a second. And in the proof, hold me accountable to make sure I include um, the complex case. Yeah, good question. Although remember, for complex numbers, the dot products defined look differently, right? For complex numbers, it's not just the first coordinate of this guy times this guy. It's the complex conjugate of the first coordinate of this guy times that guy. And, and that will come out to play in the proof. So we should prove this in general. So V, um, we'll just note, is some is, um, inner product space that can be over either the reals or the complex numbers. OK. So I, I want to show you this proof because it, it shows a really, really important um, well, this proof technique is kind of like the, the main proof technique for proving just lots of stuff in linear algebra. And, and the idea is, is first you convince yourself that like, oh, of course that's true for your basis vectors. And then it's like, well, since it's true for my basis vectors, and since this plays nice with linearity, since it's bilinear, or, or if you over C, almost bilinear, sesquilinear, then it's going to just extend over E into vectors, right? So, so let me give my basis vectors some names. Let's say these basis vectors are like v1 through vn, right? Give them some names. And like first convince yourself that this is like, of course, true for your basis vectors. So it's like, okay, well, suppose you have some like vi and vj, where i is not equal to j. Then like what, what is the product of vi with vj? Well, that's just going to be 0 by definition of being orthonormal. But what is like the coordinate vector for this guy? The, the coordinate vector for this guy is just, well, for the first one, for the, the coordinate vector for the coordinate vector for uh, vi in terms of your basis b, is just all zeros except there's a 1 in the ith position. So here there's like a 1 in the ith position, in the ith position, and zeros everywhere else, zeros everywhere else. And, and then what is the vj? What is the coordinate vector for vj look like? Well, it's just like this, except there's like, you know, the one is now to have been in the ith position is up here in like the jth position. Because this is one copy of vj and zero copies of everything else. So, so like zeros everywhere else, zeros everywhere else. So like, of course, those come out to be zero, right? You didn't have to worry about like complex conjugates because these are real numbers. And then it's like, it's not just, of course, it's true if i and j are distinct, but it's like also, and, and of course, also you have then that v i with itself, well, is 1. And of course, that's exactly where you get if you dot v i with itself, because then in both of these, you have 1 in the ith position. So, so like, this is clearly true. v i with respect to b times v i with respect to b. So of course, this is true for a vector's new basis. Maybe we've built it to be true for vectors not basis. But then you just say, OK, if I have some arbitrary vectors, v and w, let v be some arbitrary vector. I don't know. I'll call it b1, v1, up through um, b n, v n. And let w be c1, v1 up through cn vn, then we can ask ourselves, what is the inner product between v and w? And now we're just going to use linearity, right? So, or sesquilinearity. So what does this come out to be? I mean, this is the inner product of b1 v1 up through bn vn with 
C1, V1, up through Cn, Vn. What is that? Well, you start breaking this all up, right? Using the linearity, you get like it's this guy with V1, C1 copies of this guy with V1, plus all the way up through Cn copies of this guy with Vn. And then you start breaking up the first term, pulling out conjugates, or these constants will come out as the complex conjugates, and you'll end up with, this is just the sum of Bi with Cj, where you take the complex conjugate of that Bi, if it's a complex number, um, times the dot product of Vi with Wj, where you're summing over your i's and your j's. You're summing over i and j, where they're both running from like one to n or whatever. It's really a double sum. Oh, that should be a, that should be a v j. But then like, what is this? Well, we said this is always zero, unless you happen to have the i and j equal to each other. So then you just end up with the complex conjugate of B1 times C1 up through the complex conjugate of Bn times Cn. But like that is by definition what you would have if you just did your V dotted with your W in terms of the spaces. So linearity just gives it to you. It's true for the basis vectors, nearly trivially. You know, just check it really quickly. It's true for the basis vectors. And then it just extends. Therefore, it's true for any vector. And this is like a really important general strategy. Once you have a basis, you just check things are true for that basis. And then because all operations are nice and linear, typically it'll extend to any vector. Yeah. Oh, the red is for conjugate. Because B1 and Bs and Cs are not vectors, they're scalars, right? Yeah, I really should have a different notation. Yeah, none of them are. The only, um, that's why I use the red to try and distinguish the complex conjugate from saying that these are vectors. So sometimes what people do is they do like a little arrow at the end of the line to indicate it's a vector. But that would just be way too much chalk. So we're just going to have to live with the ambiguity of these are complex conjugates, whereas here I mean vectors. OK. Cool. So, so like, like, like don't, don't miss you know, like the moral of this. Like we developed the inner product to generalize the notion dot product, and now we've shown it's equally the same thing if you pick the right basis. And that's kind of been a theme of this course, right? It's like, you know, we, we take something, we try and generalize this idea from linear algebra, and then it's like, well, if you pick the right basis, or you represent this in terms of its coordinate vectors or whatever, it really is the same thing. And so in some sense, this is all new. We generalize everything to arbitrary vector spaces. But in some sense, it all just collapses back down to what you did in your first course in linear algebra. So in some sense, this course is not, you know, it's useless. You already know this all. But you didn't know that you knew this, so that's why you're taking this course. OK. Hopefully you learned something new as well. So, so here I gave you an example of calculating a, a, a you know, orthonormal vector space. H how do you do that in general? Like here was kind of an ad hoc way of doing it. Let's say I have some vector space. Let's say I'm given some inner product space, so it's a vector with a choice of inner product, V with some choice of inner product, a and I have a basis, you know, I, I don't know, let's say it's some basis V1 through Vn. How can I turn that into an orthonormal basis? Yeah, Graham-Schmidt, that's right. So it's like, 
So, so let me just remind you really fast how Gram Schmidt works. And, and then what we're going to do is like, uh, it just, it's going to be exactly the same as Lean Algebra, but I just want to like argue that like we actually have the tools we need that uh, all these things work out in the way they should. But I mean, this shouldn't be like uh, surprising given that really the inner product has this close connection with the dot product. So how are we going to do Gram Schmidt? Let me just remind you of the, of the process. Um, I'm going to do it in two steps. So first I'm going to build some orthogonal vectors and I'm going to call those W's. So W1, W2, and so forth. And, and then it's like, okay, they're going to be orthogonal, but then I want to make them, in fact, not just orthogonal, but I want to make them orthonormal. So I need to make them all unit length. So then I'll call those U1 to indicate unit length, you know, down to U2 and so forth. For your first one, you just stick with the first one given you. You just keep it V1, but then you need to turn it into unit length. So we make it um, V1 divided by its norm, which we might do is just the square root of V1 inner product with itself. And you get something that's unit length. Now, how do we define W2? So uh, first I'll just give you the definition, but then you know, we'll stop and think like why this is a good definition. Well, it's, it's almost V2, but the problem is like, you know, you might need to correct it because maybe these aren't quite orthonormal and so you need to like move it up. So you need to like adjust V2 by a little bit. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to subtract some scalar copy of the first guy. Where that scalar amount is an inner product, inner products are just scalars, and it's just U1 in, uh, inner product with V2. And then we'll define your U2 just to be, make that normal, uh, make that unit length. Uh, W2 divided by the norm of W2. So we should check really fast that I, this W2 really is, really is orthogonal to W1. So what is W1 inner product with W2? Well, here we're going to use linearity. So since it's linear in the second term, this is just the inner product of W1 with the first piece, with V2, minus, pull out the constant, this is a constant, U1 V2, um, times, oh, I shouldn't, yeah, no, I guess this is fine. Yeah, I guess that's fine. Uh, with um, W1, U1. W1, U1. Oh, something went awry here. So, so what's going awry? Ah. Um, W1 became U1 by just scaling it. So instead, I'm going to find the norm between U1 and this guy, which would just be U1, because I, I want this one to be orthogonal to my U1. And then once it's orthogonal, I'll make it unit. So these should all be U1s, U1s, U1s. And, and then we have it, because this, is just one. We built your U1 to be unit length. So now you just have something minus itself, which gives you zero. Okay, I think, I think now we're hitting, hitting the pace of this. So how do you continue? Well, you build your W3 to be orthogonal to both U1 and U2. And so you're like, okay, begin with your V3, and then we need these correction terms to make sure it's orthogonal with both your U1 and your U2. And so we're going to correct it very similar to before, where it's like, how do I make sure it's orthogonal to U1? Well, you do a correction piece just like this, U1, V3, U1. And how do I make it orthogonal to U2? 
a similar correction piece where you're gonna have U2, V3 with U2. And then you just check really fast, like, okay, yeah, sure enough, if I take, if I take, you know, uh, U1, and I ask, what is the inner product of U1 with this guy, with W3, by linearity, this is just going to be the inner product of U1 with V3. And then here, U1 with V3 times the inner product of U1 with U1, which is one. So this just becomes one. So it's just minus one copy of U1 with V3. And then if you do U1's inner product with U2, it becomes zero. So this term becomes zero and the whole thing then becomes zero. And then you have the exact same argument for why it's orthogonal with U2. U2 with W3 is just by linearity in the second term, U2 with V3 for this piece. This piece we want to disappear, but that's fine because you're gonna have the inner product of U2 with U1, which is zero, minus, and now you have U2 with this last U2, which is one. So you just get a copy of the scalar, which is U2 and V3, which is exactly what we started out with. So you end up with zero. So at each step with these correction terms, you can just build it to be orthogonal to the previous guys. And then once you have it orthogonal, you make it into a unit vector. So we call V3 to be whatever W3 is, but now is a unit vector. And you just continue in this fashion. So what Graham Schmidt gives us is a nice result. Any finite dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis. We've already seen before that any finite dimensional inner product space has a basis. And so now we can just turn that into an orthonormal basis. Okay. So I think in the last seven minutes or so, what I wanna do is I wanna show one nice application of orthonormal basis. If you build a matrix by just making its columns the vectors in some orthonormal basis, that matrix is gonna have a lot of nice properties. And so let's just, let's just talk about this really fast. So if you build a matrix, um, let's call it U, that's gonna be some, say, N by N matrix over some field where that field is either the reals or the complex numbers, that matrix is going to be called unitary if its columns are vectors of an orthonormal basis. For Fn or of Fn. So like identity matrix is one you know, trivial example, but they're more interesting ones. I think Alex said, that says something like this earlier. Um, what if you build a matrix that does something like, what was your example, Alex? Um, something like this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's just the rotation matrix, right? If you think about this as being a map, say from R2, to R2, 
This is just the map that sends the vector 1, 0 here to root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, and sends the vector 0, 1 here to negative root 2 over 2, negative uh, positive root 2 over 2. So it's rotating you counterclockwise by um, like 45 degrees, right? By pi over 4. So there's a lot of nice properties that these matrices have. And so let me just go ahead and list some of them. The following are equivalent. First, you're given some matrix and it's unitary. U is a unitary matrix. Well, let me give you some equivalent conditions to being unitary. One is that the inverse of a unitary matrix is, well, let's think. First, I'm claiming it's invertible, right? I'm saying it's invertible, but how would I get the inverse of it? Oh, good, conjugate transpose. You, you already know why. Well, if you think by matrix multiplication works, it's like you have some, you have some matrix with you know some columns, uh, some some rows, and you're multiplying by this other matrix. And I want it that when I do the first guy times the first guy, I go one, but the first guy times everything else is zero. Well, that's already the property of an orthonormal basis, right? So. You might just think, oh, you just put it next to itself. Except, in order to have this first guy times him give you one, what you're really doing here is a dot product. And in order for your dot product to be well defined for complex numbers, you need it to be um, taking the, con the conjugate. So, so it's just the transpose if you're over the real numbers, but over the complex numbers, you need to do conjugate transpose. So, so this is saying, this is saying two things. It's saying that u times its conjugate transpose is the identity, or its conjugate transpose times u is the identity. So I think it's pretty clear how the first implies the second. Actually, you can think both ways, right? Like, if you have these properties, then you're really saying, like, you know, this vector times itself gives you one, but with anything else gives you zero. Well, that's exactly what you need to be an orthonormal basis. So I don't think it's too hard to see that these are equivalent. But then you're like, oh, by symmetry, you also have the complete opposite is true, right? It's like him times him is I. Just by symmetry, you would also then immediately have that the conjugate transpose is also unitary. If these are equivalent, and U and U, uh, U, and U conjugate transpose are playing symmetric roles in these equations, then you automatically get for free that its conjugate transpose is also a unitary matrix. Which means you could think of your orthonormal basis as either being this guy, or you could think of your orthonormal basis as being this guy, right? Okay. Um, the other properties I think are a little bit less obvious. When we went from here to here, you just look at this picture, it's like, oh, preserved this angle. We want to say that happens in general, that angles are preserved, but our angles are calculated in terms of our dot product. So really, we're just going to say our dot product is preserved. So preserving dot product is the same as preserving angles. And not only was our angles preserved, but also our length. This was length one, still length one. This was length one, still length one. So we also want to say our length is preserved. For all of you. So this penultimate statement is saying that angles are preserved. And this last statement is saying the length is preserved.
So I guess, you know, like, it's worth thinking about why some of these statements are true and how you move from one to the other. Um, maybe, maybe I can just like show you like maybe one, one implication of how you move from one to the other. And, and then, you know, you can try and think of like how you get the other implications to show they're all equivalent. So, so say I want to go from like, you know, this last one to the one above it. How, how would we do that? Well, what we could do is we begin by thinking about, well, the norm squared is just defined to be uv dotted with uv. But then we know that uv dotted with u, oh, oh, I think I'm actually proving the opposite direction. Let me, let me prove this opposite direction. The one above is actually a little bit harder. Um, there's like some bootstrapping that, that takes place there. Okay, so, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to prove right now how to go from this middle statement to this last one. Okay, really quickly, this is the same thing as uh, a dot product is just the conjugate transpose of the first guy multiply with the second guy as matrix multiplication. But that's the same thing then just as V conjugate transpose, U conjugate transpose, U, V. And then U conjugate transpose U, if you believe that's a density matrix, so if you accept this one, then that's just identity. So then that's just V transpose V, which is just V dot V, which is the magnitude of V squared. Okay, well, well there's one direction in the proof. I think you can also believe that these are equivalent. And then by symmetry, you should believe that these are equivalent. <sighs> but there's a few more directions to do. Like you can try and think, how can you move from this bottom guy up here? So you need some kind of bootstrapping argument and you can do that. And then you need to go from him back up to one of the guys above him. And then you'll show they're all equivalent. But we'll just leave it there. The more important thing when you know is these very nice properties of unitary matrices.